and Klaus convinced him to come and spend some time here at Utah where he met Rich Friesenfeld and Elaine Cohen and learned about some of the, the computer graphics that was going on here. And uh, he took some of that new, new information and, uh, and the milieu of graphics here back to Germany and did amazing things. Uh, he started out as a, as a pure mathematician and uh, has wound his way around literally, I think, uh, to uh, applied mathematics and physics and computer science, computer graphics, medical imaging, uh, and more. Uh, he's very well known for his work in nonlinear dynamics and fractals. And uh, then in the mid-90s, he did another shift to where he created a new center for medical image computing called Vivas, um, which is now a Fraunhofer Institute. Um, for medical image computing, and he's here today to uh, share some of those more recent work, uh, more recent results in medical image computing. So please join me in welcoming Heinz Otto Pike. Thank you. I have to tell you when I obtained an email from Chris a couple of months ago, it didn't take me more than 10 seconds to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and if he would have invited me for a 15 minute lecture, maybe to nobody, I also would have accepted. <laughs> and that is simply because my attachment to the University of Utah is very, very deep and very, very emotional. And Chris has said a few things about that. When I look at my life, which is now 40 years of doing mathematics and other things, there were a few things which were really changing my life. The very first one was when I met Fritz Herzebroch, who doesn't mean much to most of you, one of the greatest mathematicians in Germany at the time when I joined the University of Bonn. And he, he turned me into a pure mathematician, believing that there would be nothing on the planet more interesting than doing algebraic topology. And then I met Klaus. And at that time, I was looking at maybe changing my point of view a little bit, but not really. And I accepted to come to Utah in 79. And I started what I would now like to call the golden <laughs> days at the University of Utah that I had. And why were they golden? At the time, it was just a wonderful experience, a wonderful place, wonderful nature, very, very special faculty. I have to say this again, very special people good scientists anyway, but very special people. That is what I enjoyed at the time. But I didn't know how important it was for me. Because when I arrived here, somehow I met Rich and Elaine, and I saw for the first time what computer graphics means. Remember at the time in 79, most people on the planet didn't know about computer graphics didn't exist yet as a mainstream common thing. And that changed me in a way that it opened my eyes. And when I left Utah, I had to come back. And when I left Utah, I had to come back. So I came between 79 and 85. I came multiple times and I think in in the total amount of time that I've spent here with friends in Utah was probably more than two years total. And as I said at the time, I didn't know how it was changing me, but it did. And of course today I'm totally and very passionately within medicine. And this transition from a pure mathematician into medicine needed the stays in Utah. And therefore, when I was walking campus yesterday, after 21 years, it was deeply emotional because I, I came back to 
where I had changed. So it's a wonderful experience to be back with you and see my good old friends, Nelson and Frank and of course Richard and Elaine and Klaus and Chris. And I'm happy to share with you what I have prepared for today. I'm not going to go back into fractal geometry again because that, that was one other thing that I discovered in Utah. And I'm sure without being in Utah, I would not have discovered fractal geometry. I remember when we had done our first experiments and we were in the faculty room and I was showing them to Frank Hoppenstedt. Who remembers Frank Hoppenstedt? Some of you do. He looked at that and said, yeah, 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 I think you should go and get that book from Mandelbrot. <laughs> I said, who's Mandelbrot? And I went to the library and got it and couldn't understand the thing. And some of you know why, because he is very difficult to understand. Benoit <laughs> became one of my best friends, and of course I owe a lot to Benoit in the same way I owe a lot to the University of Utah. Let me say a few words about my current institute. The Fraunhofer Mavis Institute for Medical Image Computing. You see the building that we have, it's uh, all for us. And it is actually housing two parts, the research part and also the commercial part. And let me tell you that the Fraunhofer Mavis started in Bremen, but now also has affiliates at the University of Lübeck up here, at the German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg, and also at the University of Nijmegen in Holland. And it is devoted not to do science. It's not to devoted to do nice things in image processing and so on and so forth. It is totally devoted to medicine. And we are looking at the major diseases and we are looking at them always from the point of view if we can make a contribution for that disease, does it have impact? And only if we are convinced that it does, then we pick up the research. Now that's very important for me now, and of course that's the biggest change in my life, because I used to be interested and motivated just by, I wouldn't say just by, but mostly by developing interesting scientific methods. Now it's all medicine. And in terms of impact, we look at the really important epidemiology, epidemiologically important diseases of the brain, of the lung, of the breast, prostate, liver, kidney, colon, and heart. And almost, I would say, 67%, 60 to 70% of what we are doing is devoted to oncological diseases. But also, the major diseases of the lung, the heart, and the brain, as you can see here. And we are very happy that today, if a woman walks into a radiological service and gets a breast exam, be it digital mammography or breast MRI, in 50% of the cases, she is examined with software from us all around the world. And that's impact. That's what we are trying to do. But we are also interested in methods, of course. But they're all focused on human diagnostics, intervention and therapy. And in terms of methods, uh, of course, we do a lot of image processing, visualization, human machine interfaces, navigation. I will briefly touch upon that. Computer-aided detection, like how can you find breast cancer early when it's still not visible to the human eye? registration, fusion, image fusion, but then also MR physics, MR sequence development, and a new and rapidly growing part in Fraunhofer Mavis is biophysical modeling and simulation. But as I said, the entire devotion is towards medicine. And uh, we are very proud that uh, for one year now we also have a three tes Tesla magnet in our institute so we can really do also basic MR physics development. And 
that is what I told you already. And of course you can only have an expectation to have medical impact if you have really clinical connections. And we have built over the years a network of clinical partnerships of more than 100 around the world. And around the world is not because we like to travel. It's because, as you will see in the examples that I will show you, medicine, unlike our science, basic science, is done very differently in the different parts of the world. Simply because the diseases have very different meanings to the populations in different parts of the world. Here's a map where you can see where our clinical partnerships are, and you can see that the big cluster over here in the far east, and I will actually talk about an application which is supported in a big part by these cl clinical, clinical partnerships in the far east. You also see a lot of clinics over here, and that is basically our network. Now let me go into my last introduction of the institute and say there is Two parts. One is the Fraunhofer Institute, which is not for profit, and that was established by myself in 1995. It employs at this point around 105 researchers, not counting students. And then in 1997, I founded a commercial spin off company, which is now publicly traded by the name of Mavis Medical Solutions, employing around 170 people, and uh, my functions are, as you see, here. So uh, that is what I'm doing in Bremen. One word about Fraunhofer. Most people all around the world know Max Planck and the Max Planck Institutes. Fewer people know Fraunhofer. The Fraunhofer Society is very much like the Max Planck Society. Actually, it has the same number of researchers, it has the same budget, it has the same distribution all over Germany, but it is different in one way. While Max Planck is entirely pure research, fundamental research, Fraunhofer is applied research and applied in a very, very particular way. A typical Fraunhofer Institute has to, must generate at least one third of its budget by industrial contracts. And that, of course, changes everything. If you have to be successful with this industry, you have to make sure that you can. So we have several layers of going from, from let's say, basic research to something in between to finally doing things which can really be sold to industry. That's what the Fraunhofer mission is. Now let me get into my topic and let me say what I'm trying to show you today as a model example for how we work in the Fraunhofer Mavis. I would like to show you how we can take a scientific approach to minimizing surgical risk. And we do this not just for the liver but also for the lung and the brain in very similar ways and I will focus on the liver. So let's briefly talk about <coughs> the liver and the distribution of liver surgery necessity in Western countries. And in Western countries, including this country of course, by far the most indication is <coughs> by metastatic disease. Remember, the liver is a filtering organ, and that means if there's a primary cancer somewhere, then most likely, sooner or later, some cancer cells are going to go through the bloodstream into the liver and are setting metastatic disease. And that is the biggest problem of surgery of the liver in the Western countries. There's also primary liver cancer, known as HCC, the pathocellular carcinoma, they are very infrequent in Western countries. And there's bile duct cancer, a very particular form of a very nasty cancer growing along the bile ducts, and again, very infrequent in Western countries. And these are the oncological 
aspects of liver surgery. And then there's another one which you may have never heard about. You all know about liver transplantation from cadaveric livers, in other words, from people who have died. There's also what is known as living donor liver transplantation. And that means that you pick a part of a healthy person's liver and transplant that part into a needy person. And that works <coughs> because the liver is the only <coughs> organ in a human which has a fantastic property, and that is it can regenerate. So in other words, if you take, let's say, half of a patient's liver, because you have to, because you want to operate it in an oncological situation, then if you do it right, and we will talk about how to do it right, the other half of the liver, assuming that was healthy, is regrowing into a full liver within a couple of months or up to a year. And because of that, you can take, if you do it right, from a healthy person, part of the liver and transplant that. And then the two parts are growing to an entire liver again. It's a very, very unique situation, which is not true for any other organ, as you know. It would be nice if it would. Now let's look at far eastern countries. And then you will see the big change. <coughs> Metastatic disease, yes, but now you see HCCs, primary liver cancer types, huge. In fact, we were talking about this earlier in China, right? In China, primary liver cancer disease is the most frequent form of oncological cases that we have in China, unlike over here where it's breast cancer and lung cancer. So it's a totally different picture. And because of that, the devotion of the society, the devotion of the medical system, the devotion of the doctors who treat these diseases is different. It makes a big difference whether that is your primary thing or whether it's something which happens maybe every so often. Bile duct cancer, also very, very frequent. And now look at living donor liver transplantation. There are countries like Japan where liver transplantation, heart transplantation from cadaveric organs, in other words, from organs donated from dead people, does not exist simply because for religious and ethical reasons they cannot open the body of a deceased person. So, believe it or not, Japan was joining liver transplantation only in 1992 after the first case of living donor liver transplantation had been done at the University of Chicago. Up until that point they didn't have <coughs> liver transplantation. So all the cases in Japan and most of the cases in China, <coughs> in Indonesia, in Singapore, Malaysia, are living donor liver transplantation cases. So you can imagine what that means. The best surgeons doing this are found where? Obviously in these countries. So if you want to have impact, you better work with them. That's why it is so important to have a worldwide distribution of clinical partnerships, because diseases do not mean the same thing in one place compared to another place. So what I'm going to show you now is something like 21 years of doing research on liver surgery. And uh, I want to walk you through the steps carefully and explain the cases in a way that you both see the scientific aspect of it, but also the clinical side to it. So I want to start with the oncological situation, which is at hand for a liver surgeon who wants to remove a lesion that could be a metastatic disease, a primary liver cancer, or a bile duct cancer. And I want to do that in a cartoon, where I have a lesion like this, and I have to tell you that even with the best imaging equipment that we have today, and in the future, we will not be able to say exactly here is a lesion, and exactly there we have healthy liver tissue. We won't be able to do that. 
and I will convince you in a couple of seconds. And therefore, removing the lesion for the surgeon is a huge problem. The problem is he wants to have what he calls a R0 resection. And let me tell you what that means. It means he wants to be sure that once he has taken out the lesion, he can prove by pathology that the entire lesion is inside and that the cutting surfaces are free of cancer cells. That is what he calls an R0 resection. And in order to do that, he chooses to take out more. He picks a safety margin, as they call it, of half a centimeter or 0.8 millimeter or one centimeter or what have you. And of course, if you take out more than you would need to, and you do that in order to be sure that you have all the cancer cells removed, then you are necessarily cutting into local vascular structures. But now if you dissect vascular structures, let's say that's an inflowing vascular structure, then of course everything which is dependent on that subtree will not be supplied anymore. So you are creating what we call parenchyma, tissue at risk. And obviously if you take more of a safety margin, then you are more safe in terms of removing all the cancer cells. But then, then you are less safe in terms of, is the liver going to tolerate that? And that is a surgical dilemma. You want to be safer in terms of oncology, but then you are less safe in terms of the survival of the liver. Now, fortunately, the liver can regenerate. So if you take out a margin like this, and this part, as in my cartoon, would become dysfunctional, the liver would be able to tolerate that if the amount of tissue in that way would not be too large. We will talk about what it means not being too large. So that is the dilemma. That is the kind of risk we want to investigate. Now let's look at a liver and let's look inside. And when we look inside, you can see vascular systems. In this particular case, we have a corrosion cast, something which we have obtained from a dead person, deceased person. And what you see in this corrosion cast are two of the four vascular systems in a human liver. The yellow system is the portal vein, transporting blood from the intestinal system into the liver for filtering and processing. The black one is the hepatic vein, draining the blood from the liver, bringing it back, back into the circulatory system. Now that's two, but then there are two more. That is the hepatic artery, which is everywhere in between, delivering the liver with oxygen, because mostly the liver is a huge chemical factory, and you know all chemical factories need oxygen, right? And all chemical factories are producing good stuff and bad stuff. And the bad stuff has to be taken out. And that is what the bile ducts do. So the bile ducts are everywhere in between the systems that you see. So that is a complexity that you have. And of course, this complexity may have inside lesions that you want to take out. And now you begin to see what kind of, a, of an art it is to do surgery on such a system. But I still want to explain to you what the risks are. And in that regard, we have set up an experiment a while ago in which we have taken one of these corrosion casts, have imaged it with high-resolution computer tomography, have taken the data into the computer, have then computed the skeleton of the vascular system. In this case, it is the portal vein. Now we have it in the computer and can do experiments with it. And we have placed a lesion artificially right there. And then we have asked ourselves, let's assume we take half a centimeter around that lesion. How much of that vascular sy system is going to be impaired? So in other words, half a centimeter around is taken out. And everything which then is cut and dependent will be impaired. 
Do you understand that? Of course. Now we increase to one centimeter, and everything which is colored yellow, in addition, will be impaired. We increase to one and a half centimeter, and everything which is colored green, in addition, is going to be impaired. <coughs> that is setting up the color chart for the experiment. Now, let's look at the experiment. The experiment is about what is the risk distribution, the risk in the sense of impairment of the liver, as a function of position of the lesion and the size of the margin. What is the risk distribution? Is it basically uniform or maybe not? And in order to find out, we did this experiment we placed, say, one million lesions in that 3D environment and computed the risk according to the color scheme. And let's now see what we find. So now we are moving the lesion systematically in 3D through this particular highly individual vascular system. And you understand the color coding now. And you might say, as long as the lesion is mostly at the boundary of the system, a surgeon definitely could predict the impairment by experience. But soon you will see the lesion is uh, coming more centrally located. And then all of a sudden you see big events happening. As you can see now, sometimes the entire right or left liver becomes impaired. And you also can see that sometimes a small change in position changes the impairment dramatically. Now what does that mean? It means simply that the risk distribution is highly non-uniform as a function of position and size of margin. It also means that having experience in liver surgery is a good thing, but maybe very, very insufficient. <coughs> because this risk distribution at the same time is highly individual. So that is where we want to take off from and now I want to really talk about the results that we can take from this experiment. So we want to take home from this the risk distribution is strongly non-uniform as a function of position and margin size. So how did liver surgeons in the past, and even in many hospitals today, cope with this? Well, they had two things to guide them. One is the CT images of a patient's liver. And I want to dare to show a piece of software, and I will come back to that later, in which we can actually see a patient in a typical situation what you see here is already a CT slice of, let's say, two millimeter thickness through a patient liver. And what you can see here is something which looks suspicious. Do you see that? And maybe here too. And maybe down here as well. It's something which appears a little bit darker. These are metastatic disease indications. You also see these whitish structures. Do you see them? These are vascular structures which are visible only because the radiology department has done a wonderful job in contrasting the vascular structures by a contrast agent and then imaging the liver exactly at the time point when the contrast agent comes into the liver, which is an art in itself. Now what is the surgeon doing in the old days and even in most hospitals today? They are going through the slices and they are trying to see where the lesions are. And this is a very, very typical and also very difficult case where, the, where, where you have multiple lesions, but where you can also see the idea to hope to be able to say exactly where you have a cancerous tissue and a healthy tissue is hopeless. Do you see that? It simply can't be done, at least not with imaging today and for very, very particular reasons, uh, most likely also not. So that is one thing, they are glancing through these slices, they do this over and over again, and then in their mind they are building a three-dimensional model. Now, 
You couldn't do that, I couldn't do that, but they can because they work on livers every day. So looking at these slices, they somehow build a three-dimensional representation. So they don't see much of the vessels, you would say, but they see this and they see this and they somehow also see the three-dimensional model of the vascular structure in their mind. Now is that reliable and right and wrong? Well, we don't know. Let's go back to the PowerPoint and let's look at the other tool that they use. The other tool that they use is what they call the Cuino model. Up until 1957, liver surgeons who are doing liver surgery like late 19th century had no idea about the organization of the vascular systems in a liver. And then the French surgeon and anatomist Cuino, after doing many studies from deceased people, came up with a model. And he said, basically, everything can be organized along the portal vein and its major supplied partitions. And he came up with eight parts of a human liver, which are defined as whatever is supplied by the portal vein after the third bifurcation. Now, if you have bifurcations and you go to the third order bifurcations, then you have how many parts? Two to the third, which happens to be eight, right? So eight is not a magic number. It comes from the idea of looking at whatever is supplied after the third bifurcation. And he believed very strongly that a human liver can be partitioned this way. And they assigned these Roman numerals. And now when you talk to a liver surgeon and you talk to, let's say, segment 8, they know it's up here. If you talk about segment 2, they know it's up here in the left liver. By the way, when I say left, I mean left. And I'm not uh, left-right impaired. Left is here and right is there because doctors like to look at things like this, right? Now, the other thing is that he discovered or believed that he had discovered that the hepatic artery and the bile duct would grow like vine along the portal vein. In other words, would follow the same, the same partition. And then he believed to have discovered that the hepatic vein would somehow grow in between stuff. And therefore, what liver surgeons used to do and are still doing is this. They look at the CT and they somehow try to superimpose a 3D model in their mind guided by this very schematic partition of the liver. That's what they do. Now, the question is, is that correct? And we did a study with an anatomist from the University of Geneva, Professor Fasel, in which we would take corrosion casts from deceased people, and we would superimpose the schematic partition following Cuino, and then do the real partition according to what is really the third bifurcation and the territory supplied by the third bifurcation. Are you roughly following me? I, I suppose you are. So here is a partition according to Cuino in this particular view. Remember, it's 3D, so you may not see exactly the same view as I showed in the partition. And now here's reality. So let's go back and forth at least one more time. So here's a partition according to Cuino, guiding a surgeon by using Cuino's scheme. And here's reality. <coughs> now this publication, which uh, took us a couple of years to really do for a whole number of such corrosive casts, proved definitely that the partitioning of the liver using Cuino is a wonderful idea, but unfortunately, the anatomy of the vascular structure in a human liver is highly, highly, highly individual, and also varied. And I want to show you that in these four cases at least. These are just four cases of livers partitioned according to third order bifurcation territories. And you see the same colors for the same segments. So for example, here you always see segment 
8 and segment 5, as earlier. And now you see the same color and the same position, roughly, but you see also the territories are entirely different. And I didn't choose extreme cases, I just show you they are highly variant. So what does that mean? It would be nice if we could at least help the surgeons to become more patient specific. And in the first step, of course, that would simply mean could we somehow have a picture of a patient's liver, certainly not like this, because this kind of detail of bifurcation complexity you can only get from a diseased organ. What you have at hand are the computer tomography image slices like this, which never will achieve a resolution sufficient to obtain such detail, but at least it would be nice to see a three-dimensional model of the complexity of a patient's vascular system. Can we do that? By the way, here you see this whitish stuff, and that's exactly the entrance of the portal vein, which you see here in the corrosion cast. So can we do that? Well, that is what we started with in the early 90s, and it was easy to do in a couple of model cases, but it was extremely challenging to do it in such a way that you can basically do it regardless of how high quality ACT imaging you have, and regardless of how bad the pathology of the patient is. So to really make it applicable in a huge range of cases was a lot of work. It took, took roughly six, seven years. Now, at this point, we can do something like this. And more or less automatically, we can come up with the extraction of the vascular systems with their topology. And that is already a big help to a surgeon because now we can supply a surgeon with this kind of imaging. So on the left you see a typical case again with met metastatic disease. You see the vascular system somehow in that slice. And for this particular patient, here you see the extracted hepatic vein. Remember, that is the vascular system which is draining the liver. And you see the lesions in 3D, of course. And you see that now we have superimposed on the vascular tree the safety margins of half a centimeter, one centimeter, 1.5 centimeter, so that the surgeon would know if he or she would take the lesions out with half a centimeter safety margin, then he or she would impair everything which is colored red. Right? And notice that he, if the safety margin would be increased to one centimeter, then there's a jumping behavior. Do you see that? Then all of a sudden, this branch to segment five is also impaired. While if he would increase to one centimeter, then almost nothing is added in terms of risk. This explains a little bit the jumpy, you might say, discontinuous behavior of the risk situation in the risk distribution that I showed you as a function of safety margin, right? That's pretty clear now. So that, of course, was already of big help, because now they didn't have to really look at the slices and build this 3D situation in their own mind with some reliability, but maybe not often very high reliability. But the real question, of course, is if you impair the vascular structure as much as you see here, how much impairment do you have in the parenchyma? And that is a big problem because the resolution of CT is limited and because of that limited resolution you cannot extract more detail of the vascular tree from the CT. There is simply not more information contained. And you could obtain more information if you would hit the patient with more More what? Radiation. Radiation, right? But of course then you would do big harm to the patient. So there's another risk situation which you have to balance well again. Okay, so that is our next step. And in order to talk about the next step, we have to make a big transition. We have to make a leap from 
data which are really obtained in CT to modeling the pine chima at risk. And modeling means we have to come up with a mathematical model for that, which is not in the data, which is guided by the data, which is, which is patient specific, but is not measurable in the data. And of course, the big question then is, if we have several models, which model is right? And I say this because I don't want to forget that we are talking about human medicine. If it would be animal medicine, or if it would be mechanical engineering, then you could set up test cases in which you could verify your models very carefully. But we are talking about human medicine. And validating models in human medicine is very, very difficult. And a big problem of our community. How do we do it? And I want to say this because I don't want to forget it. The medical community, over time, has developed its own standards for proving something is right or wrong. And what is that? You all know. It's taken over from pharmaceutical studies. Nowadays, if you want to get FDA approval for a certain procedure, what do you have to prove? You have to prove it in a medical patient study, including hundreds, if not thousands, if not ten thousands of patients. This has taken an enormous amount of time, money and effort, and of course our entire community trying to bring more science into medicine will sooner or later get stuck because we cannot afford to do these studies. And that is simply because the medical community at this point believes entirely only in something if it is proven by a study. Now suppose you as a scientist in physics or computer science or what, what have you would only be allowed to say what I'm doing here is valid if you could show I have done a study. Maybe not a human study, but some other kind of study. Our science would not be where it is today, it would be here. We have different ways of showing evidence for what we are doing is right or wrong. And that's, that is a culture which is very important. It's an enormous culture that we have built over the centuries in terms of validating what is good and what is bad. And medicine doesn't have that. So there's a big clash if you do something which is coming from science into medicine. So let's look at it. So here is reality, let's say, and what can we do to somehow understand what the territories at risk are? Well, if we would have resolution, as in a corrosion cast, in a patient imaging situation, then we could do it, because then we would simply do closure operations and we would have the territories which are supplied by a certain subtree of that system, right? But we don't have. So it would be nice if we could somehow build a model which would give us this kind of complexity based on a rough tree that we can extract from medical imaging. And now I want to hit you with something which is connecting back to my time, almost in Salt Lake City, and that is what is known now in the field as Laplacian fractals. Apparently they have to do with solving the Laplace equation, but I'm not going to do that for you, uh, at least not immediately. I want to hit you with a picture. This picture is a picture which I first saw in 1997. And I couldn't believe my eyes. Why? Because I was desperately looking for models which would give us the vascular trees in the human liver. So I was, I was really looking for something. And I saw this picture. And I learned how the picture is obtained. It is, and I will show you in more detail, a high voltage discharge in acrylic glass. And if you look at that, it really looks like vascular trees, does it not? So I asked myself, maybe that's useful. But now before I go on, let me show you what that really is. It's the same as this, lightning in the sky it's the same kind of thing as you see in this experiment. And I learned at the time 
but we basically understand how lightning occurs, but we don't know much from the point of view of real physics. So let's look at the experiment in detail. For that you need an electron accelerator. And you need a block of acrylic glass. And then you set the energy properly at around 5 million electron volt. And you shoot electrons into the acrylic glass. And in that high energy, moderately high energy, you can shoot them inside. And of course that is a non-conductor, so they get stuck. And if you shoot more and more, you have a cloud of electrons captured in acrylic glass. And there they sit and wait for you. And waiting for you means waiting for the second part of the experiment. Now while the first part needs high-tech equipment, the second part needs just a nail and a hammer. The nail is a conductor. You nail the nail into the acrylic glass, just slightly, barely, and then the electrons, which are sitting around here, are happy and say goodbye and leave via the conducting nail. But then they are making pathways for the other ones, and they say, oh, we are going to leave too. And that is what I want to show you in the experiment. Who get that? Again and again and again repeated. It's a loop, of course. And what you can see is some lightning happens, which is a sudden discharge, which is creating heat, and that heat is somehow burning the pathways into the acrylic glass. So that's what we have here. And that is how this came to life. And actually, the point where the nail was driven in is exactly at this location. So how can that help us to do anything? Well, here's a cartoon. The slice, a two-dimensional representation. So in other words, we have several branches of the portal vein. In this case, let's say four. And what we do is we set up Laplace's equation to compute the potentials of each of these branches. So we isolate a branch, and we compute its potential, its electrostatic potential. And what you see here is a rendering of the equipotential lines, and also a rendering as a surface, which is, of course, falling off logarithmically from the branches. The boundary conditions are zero on the boundary of the liver, but also zero on the other branches. So we are just looking at the potential of one subbranch. And then what you're going to do is you create a new artificial potential function, which is the max of the individual branches. All right? And then that potential partitions the liver. Well, that seems pretty ridiculous. Because why should the liver grow its branches in its vascular trees along the Laplace equation? Well, who knows? Maybe there's a self-organizing principle at work, much like in the high-voltage electrical discharge. And by now, people in physics understand very precisely how to model the Lichtenberg figures, as they are called, the high voltage electrical discharge patterns as a dynamic interpretation of Laplace's equation. So that's why we came to the idea, let's do that for the liver. By the way, there's also fundamental research at a Max Planck Institute in, in Tübingen, which is building on the, on the conjecture that the evolution is guided by small potential differences. So there are other reasons to do this. So this is model number one. Here is model number two. In model number two, in the cartoon, I have two liver cells. And I have to supply the liver cells with a vascular structure. The hybris is where vascular structure comes into the liver. And I can do this in several ways. For example, by drawing a vascular system like this, to both cells, or I can take one major branch, bifurcate. And now I can look at maybe an idea, and the idea is maybe these vascular structures in a human liver are organized in such a way that they are minimizing something. 
maybe now minimizing, the physical work of blood transport. That would make, make sense, would it not? I mean, you don't want to have a vascular system where the, the physical work of pumping blood through it is, 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 is oddly wrong. Okay, so which of the two would be better? Well, friction is the major cause of, of physical work in such a system, so the shorter the, shorter the vascular system would be in accumulated lengths, the better it would be for physical work. Now you can really model physical work, and here's the experiment. So in this experiment, we take a human liver hull, 3D, and we fill it up with a couple thousand liver cells. And then we say, as an initial state, from the hymus, that's where the part of the vein comes in, we supply every cell with its individual straight line vascular system. <coughs> from the point of view of physical work, this is not minimal. This is obviously maximum. But that's our simple initial state. And then we are going to play an evolution game in which we say, let's introduce somewhere randomly a bifurcation point. In other words, we go from the highness to that randomly picked bifurcation point, and then from there we supply by a straight line vessel again every liver cell. And how do we pick this bifurcation point after we initially picked it randomly? We are jiggling it around so that with one bifurcation, it would be minimal from the point of view of physical work. All right? So now we run the system overnight, and here is what we get. So in other words, once we have minimized with a particular number of bifurcations, then we introduce new randomly selected bifurcations, then we jiggle, meaning minimizing, and then we continue. So in other words, this is a self-organized growth process guided by something very simple, and that is minimize the physical quantity, the physical work of blood transport. And what you get at the end is some structure like that. And when you disguise this, in other words, take the colors away and show it to an anatomist who is really very, very experienced with the human liver, he would say, and we did that, this looks like a portal vein. It looks perfectly like a portal vein. Is that a proof that it is a good model? <laughs> no. It's not a good proof. I mean, it's certainly not a scientific argument. It's, it's a very, very soft argument. But that's the dilemma. We do not know whether or not the vascular systems in our organs such as in the liver, are genetically determined <coughs> up to a degree or the byproduct of a universal self-organizing process. We don't, we don't know. We have no clue. And in science, we like to go for the moon and for building better cars and building who knows what, while the greatest secrets are still in us. And these are the real challenges, at least I think. But we don't know what is right and what is wrong. At least it is an indication that maybe we can work with these models, but they are very complex in terms of computation. So we finally did what you would do if you know nothing. And that is you would say, well, if I have a branch, and I want to know whether this particular liver cell is supplied by this branch or this branch or maybe some other branch, Maybe it is simply supplied by the branch that is nearest, correct? But what does nearest mean? Now, all of a sudden, mathematics is in my way, because as a mathematician, nearest means nothing. As a mathematician, I know how many metrics? Infinitely many, and in fact, more than that. <laughs> so, so why should God choose, why should God have chosen the Euclidean metric? There's no reason, but we can try that, correct? We could say, let's now play this very simplistic game of modeling where we take a liver cell and say, this liver cell is supplied by that branch which is nearest in terms of Euclidean distance. Then, of course, that would be the equidistance lines, which you should compare now to equipotential curves. And by the way, the potential curves 
are something like a nonlinear metric. Do you see that? So you could compare the two, and that is what we have done. By the way, if you do this, if you really partition by nearest neighbor calculations, then you get a partition of the liver in this case. And now you could compare the two, the Laplacian model, which somehow looks much more scientific and better <coughs> and maybe more valid, with the dumb nearest neighbor model. And of course, they look different. But if you look at the partition, then the partition superimposed is very much the same. And you can argue mathematically quite clearly that from a distance, the nearest neighbor model and the potential model are almost the same. But the closer you go to the system, the more different they become. But anyway, so now we have models that we can evaluate, and that is what we did next. And I told you already, how do you validate models? In a patient study? Certainly not. So what do you do? Well, we were lucky that we met Professor Faser from Geneva, who is the world expert on the liver anatomy. And what he does for a living, besides the clinical work that he has to do, is trying to get his hands on cadavers, and then trying to produce corrosion casts of the liver. And he has a whole bunch of them. So we took all of them and put them into our system. And what we did in brief is, we extracted the entire vascular system from the cast, and then we pruned it down in the computer, pruned it down, cut the bifurcations down, and then we imposed our model on the pruned vascular systems, which you see up here. And now we have a good comparison between the prediction of the territories based on pruned vascular structures. Do you roughly follow what I'm doing? So that is what we did for all the cases that he had. And we found validity to a degree that using our models was a good way to predict the territories at risk in a specific space, uh, patient. So that is what we do next. And that means we now here apply the Laplace model to somehow grow the tree. Of course, we don't really grow it. But we compute the territories which are supplied by the branches of the vascular tree. And now we can use this in a particular patient where we have on the right the hepatic vein, where we have the lesions, and where we can now predict using the model how much of that parenchyma tissue is going to be impaired if we take, I abuse the colors unfortunately, these colors mean if you take one centimeter of a safety margin. So if you take one centimeter of a safety margin out here, then also this part is going to be impaired, which you can see very nicely over here. So we now have a prediction of what amount of parenchyma is at risk. And of course, we can do this for various safety margins now in our model. And we can do this, of course, not just for one vascular system, but also for the other ones. And as you see here, in this particular patient, the portal vein risk territories are very different from the ones obtained from the hepatic vein. Why is that? Well, because these three, stru three structures are entirely different. So what would you like to do to understand the total risk? Well, you would say, let's just take the union of the two risk territories that you can predict. Here it is. And you might say, now I'm done. And you might say all the surgeon has to do is now operate on that liver and take off exactly what is at risk and, wouldn't, and then would have done an optimal solution for this patient. But that would be a huge mistake. And that's the next step we want to take very briefly. But before that we do that, let's understand what that picture means. It means for this patient, from the point of view of hepatic vein and portal vein, and these particular lesions. If he wants to have a one centimeter safety margin, then at least what you see here colored in red is going to be impaired, becoming dysfunctional. And everything which is colored gray is remaining fully intact. So we can do a volume measurement 
And if that volume which is remaining intact is sufficient, which depends on the status of the liver, then this surgery makes sense. But the question is still open, how much should he take out? And as I indicated, it would be a mistake if you would say, just take out what is impaired. Why is that a mistake? Well, let's briefly look at that, very briefly. I do that in the cartoon. So in the cartoon, I have a lesion, and I have, let's say, the safety margin, and I have the portal vein. Part of the portal vein is going through the safety margin. If I would take out that safety margin, then, of course, this branch would not be supplied anymore. In other words, I would be using our predictive model, a certain region that would now be impaired, correct? Now let's do the same thing for the hepatic vein. Now the hepatic vein may look like this in the cartoon, and we cut this part, and in other words, this part would, according to our model, be impaired. But as you have seen, these regions which become impaired by taking just this out are intersecting, intersecting the other vascular system again. Right? In other words, if you just took out what became impaired based on this safety margin, in other words, you would cut over here and also cut down here, then of course, this part of the hepatic vein itself would again become impaired. And this part of the portal vein down here would again become impaired. And that is what I call risk iteration. So to make this clear in an experiment, I take a real liver, where I have a real vascular system, I take an artificial lesion, I take a one centimeter safety margin, and I look at what is impaired according to it, the hepatic vein and portal vein, and everything which is colored red would be impaired. Now if I would take all out of that, then I would take out too much, and I want to show you that in a different view, where I have in red and dark blue the two risk territories according to the portal vein and the hepatic vein, and the pink one is the intersection of these two risk territories. And if I would take the union of the two risk territories, which I have again in this picture, if I would take this out, then I would cut into the other vascular structure, unfortunately again, first iteration, that much would become impaired. Now if I would take this out, then I would again cut into the vascular structure somewhere, unfortunately, and this much would become impaired. And if you do one more iteration, then the entire liver is gone. However, if you have a lesion more located, let's say, at the boundary, and you would do this risk iteration, then it would stop. So in other words, that again shows you that the risk ideas are deeply non-uniform and deeply non-intuitive. Right? You don't really have to follow me in every detail, but I want to show you another study where we talk about sensitivity and errors. And I do this in the following way. I take again a patient. Here I have the hepatic vein, the portal vein. I take a lesion like so. And now I assume I could really measure and understand how the impairment is a function of margin. So in other words, here you have the size of the margin, safety margin, and here you have how much of the volume of the liver remains functional. Well, if the margin is almost zero, then almost the entire liver remains functional, correct? Now, if you increase the margin, let's say, to one centimeter, like over here, then in this particular case, maybe nothing has really happened. But as you can see, the risk function just for one vascular system is a very strange step function, right? And here you have the same thing for the portal vein, which is another step function. And of course, the combined risk is totally non-intuitive because you have to somehow combine these risk functions, and here it is, right? It's another resulting step function. Now, would you believe that the surgeon could somehow understand that? Of course, they can understand it once you show them, but by just looking at the images, it's highly non-intuitive. And I'm jumping over the experiments in real time, and I want to show you what we have to do to really help in the complexity of this situation. And the first thing is, 
manual resection planning. And manual resection planning means that we extract the vascular structures, that we extract the lesions, and then we assist the surgeon with something like choosing the resection surface, which the surgeon can do by, by just drawing on the computer screen, like you see here. Then the resection surface is put into the 3D structure. Then he can manipulate the surface. Then he can see which of the vessels are impaired, included, or not included. And then based on that, we do the risk computation. And he gets volumetric measurements for how much parenchyma is at risk based on our models. And then he can control everything by looking at the T CT slices again, so that he is absolutely sure that what he has done is right. So that's what is done today. And what we are working on very heavily is to come up with automatic resection planning. In other words, that all you have to do is put in a CT stack of scans, and then our software produces the optimal resection plan for this particular patient. And I can tell you, we are somewhere in the middle, but far from the end. And being somewhere in the middle and far from the end has simply to do with what I showed earlier when I talked about risk iteration. If you have something which is impaired from the point of view of hepatic vein, and another part which is impaired from the point of view of the portal vein, then if you would take out both of these, you would take too much, and if you just take the intersection, then maybe you take too little. So it has to be somewhere in between. The optimal resection amount would be somewhere in between the two. And that's a big task. And I'm not going to show you details, but here are some initial studies. This is the first iteration of an automatic resection planning, which then has to be improved by manual adjustment. Let's not go into many details about that. Let me show you a little bit of where we are looking at future research at the end. And that is, resection plans are improved by somehow providing more risk information. That is a typical way we can now display to the surgeon how the situation will look. So you have a typical liver. You have the vascular structures. You have the lesion. You have the cutting surface. And you can see within the cutting surface, we have imposed some kind of a metric which guides the surgeon in terms of where would he find risk structures in depth. And then you can see that the vascular structures have a color scheme. And I want to show you that in the magnification. And the color scheme is simply showing where in the resection surface the surgeon is going to meet risk structures according to safe, still safe, green up to red, highly at risk. These are now done routinely in our clinical partnerships which are experimental. So that's not yet commercial. And here you see a typical other case, the plant resection surface, and then the risk areas in this particular resection surface. We can also use these risk maps for navigation you have heard about navigated surgery approaches. I'm not going to go into detail about that, but that is just helping the surgeon intraoperatively to see where he is in a procedure relative to the planned resection surface. That is what you see here. Another big step we are trying to make is intraoperative adaption. I'm only touching that very briefly. I'm almost at the end. It is unfortunately true that in some 20% of the cases, the surgeon finds additional lesion during the operation, lesions that were not visible in the CT exam. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you have done a very careful radiological exam beforehand. We have done a very careful planning, and unfortunately, in 20% of the cases, roughly, the surgeon finds additional lesions during the operation. Now, what does that mean? It means, basically, that all of a sudden, the entire planning that you have been doing is useless. So, what do you do then? 
stop in the middle and go home and leave that patient? No, we have to do something. So what we are working on is a system which is online, allowing you to adopt the risk calculations after the finding. So let's assume you find a new tumor, tumor here, and the system is already able in an experimental setting in the operating room to adopt the risk calculation online. So that's another thing we are trying to do. And lastly, let me at least briefly touch on that because it's of utmost importance in Eastern countries, and that is living donor liver transplantation. And I want to explain to you what the challenge is. So here is again a cartoon, and in this cartoon you see the hepatic vein. The hepatic vein has three major branches in every human liver. The, what is this, right one, the middle one, the left one. And for adult to adult liver transplantation, basically what one has to do is split the liver of a healthy donor into two parts. And typically this is done by either cutting along the right side of the middle hepatic vein or the left side of the middle hepatic vein. So let's assume in the cartoon we are cutting along the right side. Then if we cut and split the liver of the donor, like so, then we are cutting through these branches, correct? And that means everything which is drained from these branches, which is, by the way, segment 8 and 5, will not be drained anymore. Which means if you would transplant this part to a needy person, then that liver would be largely dysfunctional because these parts would not be drained. And the remaining part that you see here may not be enough for the needy person to survive. And that is where living, living, living donor liver transplantation was before we came into play. They had to do it by look and feel. They didn't have a way to predict this. But with, this, with our new model predictor, we were able to say, in such a case, we can compute, based on our model, how much of the part of the liver which is going to be donated will be impaired by not being properly drained anymore. And that is what you see in these visualizations here. And then depending on how large these areas were, the surgeon would have to say, this liver cannot be used for donation. Or the surgeon would say, maybe I can still do it by creating an artificial drainage and somehow hooking it, hooking it up to the hepatic vein of the patient. So that was an innovation which was unthinkable before we had these models. And I'm just showing you a typical case where the surgeon can now decide whether it would be proper and better to cut along the right or left middle hepatic vein. And of course, if you want to leave that in the donor, the donor is at risk. And of course, the donor should be first priority in terms of the risk. A healthy person willing to undergo a very, very substantial surgery needs to remain healthy. In other words, the question how much of that donor's liver is remaining functional is of utmost importance. And in a sense, you now have a double risk situation because you want to maintain the safety of the donor, but at the same time, you want to be sure that what you donate, transplant, is also functional. While in an oncological situation, you only have to worry about the patient. Here you have to worry about two people. And that is what we did. First, this very, very famous surgeon of living donor liver transplantation. His name is Koichi Tanaka. I'm going to show you his face in a moment. There he is. And we did this first in 2002. And I can tell you, Professor Tanaka is the utmost living donor liver transplantation surgeon in the world. He has done most cases at the University of Kyoto. And the very first case that we did together, which is the one that you see here, we also did an experiment on the remnant, that is the part of the liver which is going to be donated, by a perfusion experiment which was done right after this part of the liver was taken out. We were able to 
check whether our prediction of how much would be impaired, which is this part based on our prediction, was actually impaired. And it looked like it was basically in agreement, which, by the way, was one of the reasons why, since that day, Professor Tanaka, who is the foremost sergeant in this field, as I said already, has done not a single case without us. And he was very instrumental in helping us to set up what we now call a distant service model. And in the distant service model, we have a particular way of doing things. We have a huge number of liver surgeons around the world who send us by a safe, secure protocol the CT images to a center within our institute. And in that center, we have dedicated technicians who are suitably educated in our software to then come up with the risk calculations, the 3D models, movies, and also data that can be manipulated by the surgeons. And those are then sent back to the surgeon. And that is what is by now FDA certified, is used in more than 250 of the foremost living donor liver surgical units in the world and also units doing oncological surgery. And up to now we have done more than 6,000 cases, which is a huge number for this service, among which we have done more than 3,000 in living donor liver transplantation, more than 2,000 in oncological surgery, and I can tell you we always get the cases which are at the limit. But the surgeons say, let's see whether with the Mavis technology we can still help that patient or not. While in living donor liver transplantation, we get all the cases from the participating surgeons. This is what is now commercially available, and what I show you in blue is extending the same kind of ideas and methods to other organs like the kidney, pancreas, the lung, and the brain. And we are having experimental setups for these and have done some 500 cases. So let me close by just saying a few words about clinical evaluation. Once you introduce something by, like this, the ultimate test, whether this is really good, is not that the pictures look good and that they make life easier. That's not sufficient. That's already a nice step. What really has to be done is clinical evaluation. And for that, you either have to do a clinical study, which is very difficult to do because all the cases that you are doing are entirely different anyway. So how do you compare? Or another way for clinical evaluation is this. And I like that much better. And that is pushing the envelope. Now what does pushing the envelope mean? That's a term used in aviation. Some pilots like to push the envelope, and then are never seen again. Pushing the envelope here means that you do cases with this kind of support which you definitely would not do otherwise. And this is now documented in a huge number of publications, both for living donor liver transplantation, and in fact the University of Kyoto, which by itself has done almost 1,000 cases with us in the last 10 years. They have come up with a totally new and innovative method of doing living donor liver transplantation, which only exists because of this new method. It would be inconceivable without. Now that's a very nice way of clinical evaluation or validation because apparently it means you do something you couldn't do otherwise. That's a much better way than proving in a huge clinical study that what you are doing makes sense. Do you get my point? And I think that's where our community has to become very strong. We have to do things in such a way that the medical community, medical, communi medical community can push the envelope, can do things which cannot be done otherwise. Then you don't need a clinical study because it wouldn't make sense. Right? That's 
my approach of getting out of the dilemma. Another one is the uh, University of Yokohama, which is the foremost clinic in Japan doing bile duct cancers, specialized for that. Same thing. They have shown that using the method, their safety has become better in many ways, but that's not sufficient. What they have shown is that they can push the envelope, that they can do cases which otherwise they couldn't have done. The same for a clinic in Shanghai. And I have to tell you about this clinic. And again, you will see how important it is to go international. This clinic is as large as a typical city clinic anywhere in the country. But it has only one purpose. It does only one thing. It only does liver surgery. So there's an entire hospital in Shanghai doing nothing but liver surgery. And you can imagine that the liver surgeons there are the most experienced liver surgeons that you can find. And again, they have pushed the envelope. And the same is true for this hospital in Beijing. And I was going to show you a case in real time, but I think I have already taken too much of your time, and I want to close by just saying, without these clinical partners who are willing to use these methods to push the envelope and really go steps that were not foreseeable before, we would not be where we are. And that's why for us, clinical partnerships are not just motivating us to do something or picking up ideas where we can apply our methods. They are the heart and soul, the bread and butter. They are everything. They are in the core of everything we do. And it's a wonderful thing to work with clinicians if you really have the feeling that you can help. So with that, let me close and show you my last slide. And I would like to say, some things are easy. <coughs> Liver surgery is not. And whatever we can contribute to it from science, it will remain an art forever. The limitations of science and medicine are clearly visible by what I have shown you, I hope. But at the same time, I hope I have also showed you, yes, we can help. But it's not like an engineering problem. It remains an art. And these people are very, very special people. Thank you very much. Thank you for a tour de force in uh, medical image computing applied in uh, modeling, simulation, and uh, visualization. It was amazing. I think because of the time, we're going to, uh, to move on. Thanks, everybody, uh, for coming, and let's thank uh, Heinz Otto one more time. Thank you. That was great. That really nice.